Welcome everyone to PRT, that's uh, Paranormal Roundtable. My name is Josh Turner, also known as Wolf, and with me tonight is my co-host, Nellie Hello. Turner. And uh, she's a lot prettier than my usual co-host, Tony, who has been on a little hiatus because he's having to work. He's trying to make a bunch of money because he wants to buy a Lamborghini. That's his dream. He said he's going to buy a Lamborghini and he's going to jump it uh, off a cliff and then turn it into an aqua, uh, what is it, an amphibious vehicle? Yes. And mm -hmm. then he's going to go from there. He's going to drive it to Miami. Yeah. I, I just made all that up. I don't even know what he's going to do. He just wants to make some extra money. So that's what he's doing, folks. And tonight it's going to be me and Nelly and we're going to be interviewing someone or having a discussion with someone. And uh, I might tell a couple stories and he's going to tell some stories and we're going to have a good time. Um, but first, prtpodcast.com. Check it out. Also, I wanted to touch base with everyone. Remember, our groups, Paranormal Encounters, Paranormal Roundtable, and Nelly, your Paranormal group. Lounge. Yes. Remember that one, please? Yeah. <laughs> She's big on that one. <laughs> the Paranormal Lounge, just where you can go and sit and have a cocktail or a cup of coffee and sit there and ponder your life and why you're trapped in a hotel with a weird-looking wife that looks like olive oil and a weird little boy that keeps saying red rum. And just be like, I can't believe I'm with these people. I'm trying to finish my book, you know? <laughs> so anyway, that that's kind of what we do there at the Paranormal Lounge. And uh, yeah, check it out. Um, you'll see it because it's got a weird, creepy lounge picture on it. And then Paranormal Encounters has got like a Kraken. That's, that one's not important. That one's Tony's <laughs> and that's his design. They're both stupid to me. Paranormal Roundtable <laughs> is the important one. And that's the one you got to check out. It's got a picture of moi. So yeah, go check it out. My beautiful face is there, grimacing for the camera. And, uh, yeah, go up there and, and, and join our groups. And, and a lot of people post a lot of weird, creepy stuff on those uh, on, and, and just all the time contributing. Uh, so a lot of stuff's in the works. So, folks, I got a lot of projects going at the same time, all the time. I don't know exactly when this is going to air, but today, as we are rec recording, today is Nellie's birthday. And we just got done eating at Fleming's. And our guest, uh, Justin Decker, he's going to be our guest tonight. He's going to guest host with us, I guess, uh, co-host with us. He's going to tell us a bunch of stuff. And um, he's been patient enough to let us finish eating dinner and come and, and like sit and talk with us or whatever. So, Justin, you want to say hello? Hey, everybody. How's it going tonight? Going good, Justin. You need, <laughs> you need to kill the people you're with to purify yourself. Wow. That's crazy. Did you hear that voice in the background, Justin? Is that at your house? Now, that might have been here. It's kind of creepy here a little bit. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm just messing with you, man. That was my cat. Actually, Justin. Okay, Justin. So what we got going on here tonight, you and me had a, had a, had a really epic conversation the other day, 90% yeah, of which did. could never be allowed to be heard by, by human ears. Yeah, <laughs> never, never before heard or never will be heard by civilized man. Speaking of which, you... Okay, speaking of civilized man, you actually lived in the jungle as a child. That is correct, yep. As a child. He was, folks, he was basically, the the the, the book, Jungle Book, was based on his life. He was like, like Mowgli. He just ran around in the jungle. He had a cat named Magira. I'm just kidding. Seriously, Justin, <laughs> you, you had a crazy uh, childhood. Now, when we were talking the other day, I just want to set the stage here. Mm -hmm. You told me a lot of crazy stories. Now- uh, and I mean, crazy as in like, I mean, you had an epic childhood. Like most people don't grow up that way. Like I That's was, true, I was, yeah. At, yeah, I was at home playing with GI Joes and jumping my bike on ramps. You were like running through the junk in the Amazon. Yep. That is correct. Yep. That's crazy. So, <laughs> and, and you, you were raised there until you were nine years old. Yep. I was born down there in uh, the Colombian Amazon. Uh, that I was actually born in a, in a big town called Via Vicentio. Uh, but I spent most of my life down there, either out in the Amazon jungle or at our school base, which was in a valley in the Andes Mountains, which is still the jungle. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So one of the one of the things I was going to ask you, you're, you're okay, so your parents were missionaries. Is that correct? Right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And they, they went down there to uh, work as missionaries. Now, missionaries, everybody knows that they, that they risked their lives. They risked their yeah. lives to try to spread the gospel. And so. Yeah, and specifically with what my dad was trying to do initially when we were down there, he was always called a contact missionary. Um, it was actually his job to try and find uncontacted native tribes. 
they would hear rumors of tribes from from locals in the jungle, local you know jungle villages and stuff. And then they would actually go out and try and find these tribes that had never been contacted before. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah, that is cool. That's really cool. I don't think I would have the patience for that. I don't. I just I couldn't do it. You know, all, all joking aside, I think it would just be too much for me to I cannot. I don't have patience for people who are already speak my language and have my culture, much less people who, you know, are down in the jungle yeah. who, you know, trying to communicate with them and trying to make them, you know, God, I don't know. Like, there's probably some things you could learn from them too. Oh uh, yeah. I know well, there initially, is. But... Initially it wasn't even trying to communicate with them. It was just trying to find them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, literally he was a modern day jungle explorer. I mean, that, that yeah. initially that's what we started. He started doing down there first. So it wasn't even trying to communicate with them. It was trying to even see them or find them. That is, that's crazy. Right. Like I said, I don't have patience for people from America. <laughs> so going into a jungle, and, and now I did travel some. I I have been overseas and been to different continents, and and I, I honestly it was, but these people were not, you know, undiscovered people that you have to teach everything to, and then they have to teach you and all that. And so, yeah. But right. what I was doing was a very different type of job, which we we talked a little bit about, Justin. But yeah. So what your your dad. He had y'all living down there and, and there was ever present danger. Like we talked about it. Absolutely. Yeah. Your family Always. was under constant threat by FARC. Now FARC, if people don't know, um, they are a communist organization from uh, Colombia who were uh, fighting to overthrow the government for like 30 years. I don't, I don't remember how long it was. Yep. Um, yeah. They, they're now I did run across some of that um, in my journey when I, in my trip, whatever, but like I said, it was a totally different uh, ball of wax for me. I wasn't there to save souls, but your dad was doing God's work. He was trying to help people and and to um, introduce them to the gospel. So you were kind of along for the ride, basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, I, I just got to play all the time while they were doing all the hard work. <laughs> and, and you and you said you literally lived in a grass hut. Well, uh, the very first house I remember living in, it was an after. My dad was done with the contact work. Uh, they were never able to actually uh, contact the tribe they had been trying to. Um, it was a tribe they had called the Hadawa tribe. Um, they had located one of their villages at one point, which was just one big giant uh, maloka. They called them just a big pavilion, basically. But they never actually got to see any of the people because the, the tribe got so scared of these foreign outsiders coming into their territory. They actually packed up and left. Um, so they never actually got to contact the, the tribe that they were that had worked so hard to, to locate. Um, <clears throat> so then we were moved out to a different tribe called the Maku. Um, this was a tribe that had been contacted but was not considered a friendly tribe. Um, they were still working on building relations. And this is the first house I remember living in. And it was actually on stilts out in the middle of the lake. Um, the reason being for that is because these natives didn't swim. Um, they didn't go out to the lake very often because they were afraid of, of the anacondas and the caimans. And we were far enough away where they couldn't reach us with their spears or their blowguns. Um, so that was the first house I remember being in out there. And at that point, it was trying to build relations with Indians. Only the men were allowed to go ashore uh, when the Indians were around. Um, they would only stay for a couple of hours because by that time, usually they had done something to irritate the Indians. And so they would escape to get back to the houses. And when you, when you're when you talking about the anacondas now, we talked about that and you, now let, let's, let's go, let's start with uh -huh. that. You, you said okay. that you once saw an anaconda that was 15 feet. Oh uh, yeah. Um, for us, anacondas were considered a shoot on site threat uh, just because there was little kids like me out there. Um, it was not uncommon to see 10, 15 footers. I have a picture on my Facebook page there, Josh, you want to check it out. Um, where there's actually a 17 footer that they had shot. And that was just considered, uh, for us out there, that was just considered an average size. Um, that wasn't a very big one. They, they would call that like a teenager, basically. 17 feet was mm -hmm. an average size snake? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you guys remember to even get to this lake where we were at, we're talking a three hour helicopter ride through the jungle. So we're so far away from civilization, you can't even, couldn't even get there unless you know where you were going. How did you like growing up out there? Um, you know, for me, it was normal. I, I didn't see it as exciting or weird or different because I really didn't know anything else. 
Uh, but I loved it. It was, it was amazing. Like how many little boys can fish out of their window and, and catch fish, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Or, uh, it was just absolutely amazing, uh, just growing up. But it, for me, it was normal as everyday life. And, and when I would come to the States or I would become into the towns around the socialized areas and the civilized areas, I was a little more lost and confused because I just didn't understand it. Wow. So you were really a dumb kid. <laughs> I'm just, yeah, I mean, I'm just playing. Way. I'm just playing, Justin. You're, very, you're actually very socially very, underdeveloped. Maybe socially under <laughs> underdeveloped, but as of I rather would con- have had a childhood like that. <laughs> right, well, as our conversation, you know, you're a very intelligent man. Very one of the smartest people I've talked to, actually. The the anaconda thing. Now, I have gotten reports of of from people. Well, not like a bunch, but of anacondas in general growing to thirty feet. Like I, I have yeah. a person that literally swears up and down. They claim that they saw an anaconda uh, that was thirty feet long. Um, now this 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 was not in Colombia though. This was for, this was in another country, but very close. And you say now you told me that you heard stories of anacondas getting up to fifty feet, fifty sixty feet. Yeah, that, that'd be the the stories that you would hear uh, on occasion. Wow. Uh, I can't say I've ever talked to one specifically in person that saw I got a first hand account. But those were definitely the stories that we heard as kids that they could potentially get that big. Man, that is so scary, dude. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't I'm not like a <laughs> deathly afraid of snakes. I don't like spiders. I'm not deathly afraid of spiders. But for me, uh, a centimeter long spider is a shoot on sight. So um yeah. <laughs> and I don't put up with snakes either. Now we had a moccasin. And I don't even know where this came from. Like it, it just, it just was like Anthony was, was he, he was in the studio a minute ago. He just walked outside, but we were working at a place for, for uh, it was a house that was being built by a very large realtor. Like he literally, his name is on the realty company, and he's nationwide. Right. Everybody knows him, and his son was actually building a house, and we did security for it. And right out of the lake, there was a dock that they had built, right? Very beautiful, beautiful house. And right off the dock, Anthony had gone around to do his round to the front and he came back around and there was a water moccasin in his chair. Oh, and, nice. <laughs> and, and one of the workers, uh, this guy, you know, from Mexico who we got, we came really friendly with him. He was the, the one of the foremans. He snatched it up and tossed it into the lake. <laughs> And Nelly's looking at me crazy. That's a, that that really happened, Nelly. Uh, when Anthony comes back, yeah. you can ask him. It's a crazy story. Um, so me, I was I supervised the whole thing. I was like, yeah, go ahead, take that snake, throw it in the lake. And he did it. And I was like, yeah, okay, good job, man, good job. And Anthony came back. Way and to I, go. Yeah, and I was like, yeah, we got rid of the snake. It's good. No, I I would not. Um, I couldn't. I wouldn't be able to live in a place where there were uh, snakes like that. Now, when I was overseas, I did encounter a caiman. I did. I, Nelly, I told you about that yep. story. I had a caiman that actually um, knocked me off my feet, and I thought, this is it. And I, I was managed to get out of the water. Uh, and it, and oh, I was lucky. told that, yeah, I was lucky. I was told that it wasn't a fully grown one either. It was it was uh, probably about half the size it was going to get to be, but it managed to knock okay. me down. But I was carrying something in my hands that could dispatch it pretty quickly, and that's what I did. So I actually well, yeah, was able to. Around us. We had the the Caiman Negro, the black caiman, which, if I remember correctly, usually gets about about eight foot. Yeah. For people that don't know, caimans are basically an alligator, um, but they tend to be smaller, more agile, and highly aggressive compared to like the American alligator that we're used to. Yep, they're, they're crocodilians, and they yeah. are very much uh, very aggressive. They can be very aggressive, yep. but one of the most dangerous creatures in that jungle you were in is the jaguar. Um, Absolutely, I, I got a funny story about them too <laughs> mm-hmm. very stealthy and they will kill anything like anything like yeah. i actually have someone who claims to now somebody i was down there with they claim to have witnessed uh in the jungles down there um a jaguar in a life or death struggle with an anaconda and the anaconda killed it but the jaguar killed the anaconda too and so wouldn't they, surprise me these jaguars enjoy the water so that that wouldn't surprise me that kind of encounter at all and they said it was about a 12 foot anaconda and it managed to, um, well, tw- I, I want to say 12 foot, but it was actually, they said that from what they saw of it, you know, they didn't, the part of the, the anaconda was in the water. So we don't know exactly how big it was, 
but it but what they saw of it was about 12 foot and it unraveled as it died and kind of slithered back into the water but they they found like the the tribes people like found it dead later on but the jaguar managed to die it managed to kill the jaguar by squeezing its rib cage mm. but they are very uh now, in another place that I was in one time, a guy that I was with got a snake wrapped around his arm, and he almost lost his arm because it, it cut off the circulation and it bit onto his neck. Um, so, yeah, and those constrictors, those are constrictors. Boas and anacondas and pythons are constrictors, and they, they, they're not poisonous, but they do have a bad bite, and their teeth are made for gripping and holding as they constrict and crush you, and then they swallow you. That's how they eat, you know, whatever. And according to tradition down in the Amazon, uh, anacondas will eat people. They are people eaters. Absolutely. Yep. People say, Absolutely. ah, they don't get back we were, enough We were to taught eat as kids. Um, and interestingly enough, what we were taught as kids was not to be so much wary of the anacondas in the water. But we were taught, and I don't know how true this is. I've never heard this anywhere else. Okay. But this is what we were taught to live down there was to be careful of the trees along the riverbank because the, the mid-sized anacondas would climb up in the trees and drop on you, and that's how they would attack you. They'd drop on you from above. Yep. Raining snakes. Yep. Nice. I've actually, you're, 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 you're right. <clears throat> there, there is a, when, we, when we were down uh, doing what we were doing, a lot of times we were in single file, and they would just say, look, if somebody gets, you know, whatever, then you got to end – you couldn't always just open up on it because then you give away a position. So you have to like be right. very careful. Yeah. And I'm not going to get real into depth with that, but you got to be yeah. real careful and you, you've got to watch the trees and jaguars are ambush predators too. And if you're out there taking a leak away from everybody, they can lunge out at you. Um, I literally witnessed myself witness that happen. There, there are a lot of things that can kill you out there. Now you also talked about the giant spiders. <laughs> the spiders are absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So down there, I mean, growing up, living in the middle of it all, we had some basic rules. If it was a snake or a spider, get away from it or kill it because you don't know what it is. I mean, it was that simple because nine times out of 10, it's going to kill you. That's were, just how we were taught. Were there any friendly animals out there? Well, there were definitely. But for survival's sake, if it was a snake or a spider, you killed it um, because you, you could not trust what it looked like. Uh, for example, my dad tells a story of him and the guys in the canoe going down the river one time when they were exploring and they had these little brown spiders that always fell like off the tree branches from overhanging, you know, the, the conyos, the creeks and all that. Mm -hmm. And they usually just brush them off. There was, they weren't afraid of them. There was no big deal. Well, one time a guy was trying to swat one of these and it reared back and it bit him on the hand. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe it was on the thumb joint is what my dad said. And they literally watched this guy's hand swell so fast, the skin split. The like, like a sausage on a grill. Yep. From this spider that was never aggressive. They, they encountered him hundreds of thousands of times. But this one time, it finally decided to bite. So, and, and as a kid, like I said, I was nine by the time I left there. So, being a young kid, the rule was, if it was a spider or a snake, you got away from it or you killed it. Simple as that. Mm-hmm. Good rule. Um, you said you, you just don't know. <laughs> yeah, and then you'll um, have the event that. Go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Well, I was going to say the event that we were talking about was the time uh, my dad and my sister. Um, I'm the youngest of four. I have two older brothers and one older sister. I was the only one born uh, down there. Um, they were out turkey hunting uh, for wild turkey in the jungle. Uh, by this time, we had uh, become friendly with that tribe, the Maku tribe. Um, we were living out in the middle of the jungle in their territory in a house that we had built out of um, different types of trees and mud and all that kind of good stuff. Um, so they were out turkey hunting in this area and they had to come around uh, a bend in the trail. I, I use the word trail very loosely. It was more of an area where they knew they could walk through. Um, and there was a log there and sitting on top of the log was a giant tarantula like spider. Um, my dad described it as the body itself without the legs was the size of a large dinner plate or like a large paper plate uh, plus the length of the legs. So this thing is massive. 12 to 14 inches, basically. Just the body itself, correct. Wow. Um, it was black in color. It was hairy, like you would look at a tarantula. And he said it was absolutely gorgeous. It had um, very striking red and orange marks across the body, like stripes, just kind of random random stripes across it. 
Um, but they looked at it and they turned and left it alone and walked around it like you're supposed to do. Like the lost world. A- absolutely. Absolutely. We'd come across things that weren't supposed to exist. But for us, it was like, oh, that's the jungle for you. That's what's going to happen. Do you have any pictures <laughs> of these uh, creatures? Um, no. Um, funny thing about in the jungle, especially back then where we didn't have the digital technology yet, right? It was still on film. Film does not last very well in the jungle. Yeah, the humidity. Mm-hmm. Um, the humidity, it molds it. I do have, like I said, on my face, my personal Facebook page, which you guys have access to, a, a bunch of pictures that my dad did take down there, um, specifically so he could do presentations back here in the States. Um, but generally, they didn't carry cameras with them all over the place. It was just just not how it was because cameras back then were big and bulky and you had to worry about the film and getting it developed and, you know, all that kind of fun stuff. Add to that, you're trying to hike through the jungle, which is not like the movies at all. You have a machete in one hand, you probably got your shotgun in the other hand, and you're trying to keep track of a little kid behind you. So a camera really isn't your priority to take pictures of all this, this stuff. That's true. Well, you know, sense. and you're yeah. there. To, you're there to try to, to 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 help people. You're not really there to to yeah the pictures yeah. and all that. So there is one yeah, thing. I mean, we uh, do have a lot of cool pictures, but you know, just not specifically of some of this stuff. Yeah, of the spiders and snakes. You were you were, yeah. You know, you're not getting close enough to them anyway. I I know that there was something that I I encountered like it was a huge like three. In, this is crazy. Like three and a half inch wasp, and it was oh, bl- yeah. it was black. And somebody told me. They called it uh, uh, the the it was Vespita. I, I kind of want to say it the way that they said it. it was like Vespita Arachna. It was like the spider the wasp, spider killer. the spider wasp. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah it's a spider killer. Absolutely. And and I yeah. watched one of these go into a burrow. Like I literally got to witness. It was one of the most amazing things I've seen um, in nature. And it and it literally got this tarantula to come out of its burrow by pretending to be wounded. And then when this, when it was a giant tarantula, what they call the Goliath tarantula down there. And it was, it wasn't the biggest one, the, the, the species, but it came out and it began to fight with that um, wasp. And typically the wasps, th- that wasp is, knows what it's doing and it knows how to um, maneuver. Ki- yeah, to maneuver. But this particular species was a gray uh, type of, of tarantula that's very agile. And that thing, it, it misjudged the attack, and that spider, boom, got it. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> and they said that if it's a bigger, one of the bigger brown tarantulas, it's kind of the luck of the draw. Like, if it, if it gets one of the bigger ones, they can typically win. They usually win. But that that the um, the uh, spider, you know, on th- that one is a, a little bit of a smaller species, but it's still big. It's got some size on it, and they move really fast. And it managed to, yeah, yeah, it managed to get up under, you know, and, and defeat it. And it was like, holy crap. And then it it just, that's pretty awesome. (laughs) Yeah. And I saw it like in, in a couple of the guys were like, check this out, check this out. And they, we were, we were watching it. Like one of them yelled and we ran over there and we checked it out and it was pretty epic. It was right there near the, near one of the creeks. And, um, the spiders like to not, not build right next to the creek, but they like to have uh, close access to water because, these spot, these tarantulas, they'll go down to the creeks and drink water like a dog. It's so weird yeah. to watch them do it. I'm just like, yeah. ooh. <laughs> yeah, it, it's so crazy. It, it, it's funny because um, in their school base out in the mountains there, which was still in the jungle, um, some of the dorm parents, I believe it was the high school dorm parents, were amateur um, entomologists. And so they were always collecting insects and bugs. And I remember one point they had captured – um, one of these, the spider killer wasps and a tarantula, and we actually got to see the same thing and watch them fight. Um, and in this one, the, the wasp actually won. Yeah. It, it, um, typically yeah, they I've do. Seen that too, and it's absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Typically the wasps do win, but there's certain species of, of those tarantulas are so fast and so venomous and so, so hardcore that a lot of times, um, if the wasp gets one of those, it's about 50, 50. So yeah, it's crazy. So anyways, you, you living down there for nine years, let me ask you this mm-hmm. point blank question. What was the sure. most terrifying encounter you had? I mean, we haven't even gotten into paranormal stuff, but I'm just talking about like, as far as <laughs> the, uh, the animals, like what was the most terrified you were of any of these animals? Um, man, that's a hard one because we were taught not to be in fear because when you're in fear, you don't react properly. But 
there was one time out of the school base, uh, we had horses. It was, it was kind of like a farm. Um, and I was out riding a horse along one of the mountain roads and I seen a large snake, uh, in the ditch, kind of, you know, in the drain ditch alongside the road, which I didn't think a whole lot of, you know, we see snakes all the time. Um, it was very large, uh, probably about a good six foot. I remember it being black and it had kind of brownish orange markings on it. So it seemed very similar to like a, a big boa or a big python. Um, down there, we pretty much only had the red tail Colombian boa as far as constrictors go or an anaconda. And it definitely wasn't either one of those. Um, I'm not really sure what kind of snake this was. It could have been um, what we call the Mata Caballo, uh, a Fertilance. Oh, yeah. Right? The Bushmasters. One of, yeah, one of those guys. It, it could have been an older one of those because they do tend to darken as they age. Um, but I couldn't be positive on identification. But I did see it. And so I became aware of it. My horse wasn't spooked. Uh, so we just kind of kept going down the road. And I looked over in the ditch again, and it was still there. It was basically pacing us. Um, and Stalking. so I kind of, that's what it felt like. Yes. I don't know if it was, uh, but it felt that way, especially as a young boy. So I got the horse to kind of speed up into a trot a little bit. Um, I looked over and the snake was still there. Um, so at this point, my young imagination just kind of went into overdrive and I thought for sure this thing was out trying to kill me. Um, so we launched into a gallop on the horse and I took off and I remember looking back at one point and saw the snake crossing the road. Um, but that was that we left it far, far behind after that. Um, so I don't know if it was trying to do anything, but I can tell you as from my perspective, it just scared the bejesus out of me for sure. Um, yeah, now I, I had a, a pretty bad, a startle reflex. So most of the times, if you heard me scream, it was probably because a frog jumped at me, uh, from the bed or something like that. Cause we always had to check our sheets and check our bed and check everything before we went to bed. Every night, oh, um, yeah, absolutely. Every night, <laughs> yeah. yep. um, before you put shoes on, you know, you knock out your shoes. Yep. Um, I actually slept in a mosquito net ninety percent of the time, um, just to keep critters and mosquitoes and bats and all that kind of stuff out of the bed. Um, but very few times was I actually scared down there, as far as from the animals, because we were in their world. Um, and if you responded properly with them and you did what you were supposed to do, chances are you were going to be safe. That's just how we were taught. Well, Justin, we do that here with our shoes because of the brown, reclu- <laughs> the brown recluse. Right. Yeah. Brown but, recluse and scorpions, I'm sure. Yeah. Brown recluses are, uh, you know, if there's one thing about Central Texas I don't like, it is brown recluse and rattlesnakes. I mean, it just seems like uh, per square acre, there's a thousand of them everywhere. And you, they, they, if they bite you, it's very necrotic. Um, my, one of my godson's, uh, football coach for his Pee Wee league team. And, and they were very good one year. And I was, I went to go watch them play and they, they went like, they went all the way to state, like, like one year and I was watching them, you know, and then the, the coach didn't show up for a couple of weeks and then, uh, he reappeared and part of his leg was gone. Oh and, my. Yeah. Yeah. And it was because of a brown recluse. And I was like, we actually you- had those down there too. Oh, they're everywhere. Yeah, they're everywhere. There's golden yeah, recluse, southwest over. recluse. There's everywhere. I mean, you have those everywhere too. But but I mean, here in Central Texas, they're just it's they're everywhere. And then rattlesnakes too. Like we're we're actually in the process. I was saying of building a house, and we went out to the land, you know. And you just, I mean, you have to watch where you step, where you walk, because uh, any of these construction sites we work on, you know, and like the the area where I where I'm going to build or where, where I'm putting the site, whatever putting it together it's you know a nice spot but you know it's just there's brush everywhere so you you can't just go out there and tromp around and and look at it the way you would like until you clear it out and you just constantly have to be on be be careful be on guard you know wear pants wear boots because there's snakes everywhere and and that's the only thing i guess i really don't i love central texas it's a beautiful place (laughs) But gosh dang, man, the snakes and the spiders just get to to the to aggravating. I've killed several brown recluses, you know, in places I've lived. And uh yep, if they bite you, man, it's pretty nasty. I mean, it's really nasty. You know it. For sure. I know uh for us, uh in the jungle, my parents had a hard time keeping clothes on me. Um, I know that sounds really silly, but the natives we lived with didn't wear any clothes. The men would wear little half grass skirt loincloths and that was it. Um, but I was Never, never allowed to go anywhere without my boots. I had to have my boots on at all times. 
Um, regardless of anything else I may or may not have been wearing at the time, I had to wear my boots. Um, and I had my machete with me. Yeah. And, and then, those were just basic requirements. You walk out the door, you have your boots and you have your machete. Yeah. You know, and the fair to Lance, that snake that you were talking about, I had heard that that, that snake is one of the deadly, it, it, it has a high kill rate. Yeah. Like it kills a lot of people. Um, and so what they call that down there in our area was the Mata Caballo, which means the horse killer. Yeah. Oh yeah. Cause it's one of the few snakes that actually has a venom strong enough off of one strike like that. It'll bring down a horse mm -hmm. and around us, they like to hang out in the pastures where the horses were. If, if it hits you as a human, you're done. I mean, it, you're done. The odds of you getting anywhere to get anything are pretty much now. I don't know if this is a Mandela effect or what. I don't know if, if you know, if you're familiar with that, but when I was, I remember oh, yeah. a, another snake that was called the fair de Mas. I tried looking that up one day because I couldn't find anything about it and I, and I couldn't find anything on it. But I remember them that there was a snake called the Fear de Mas and and for some reason it I guess it doesn't exist I guess it doesn't exist because I remember there being two kinds of Fred de Lance and the Fred de Mas, and maybe the Fred de Mas well, was see, a slam. That's term. where um I get confused because I use the term Bushmaster. Mm-hmm. And for the launch, and I have been told both that they are the same creature or they're actually separate creatures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so Very I weird. really don't know. I don't know if the, the Bushmaster is, is like a different snake, like a Fertilance, like you were saying, versus the Fertilance, or if they're actually the same, just a different colloquialism for them. I'm not really sure. Um, but yeah, I know what you mean, because I say Bushmaster and Fertilance, and I'll be told, oh, no, those are two different things. And other people will say, oh, that's the exact same one. So... I don't know. The side question here, do, they, do you speak another language from over there? Or was English your first language there? Or? Uh, Spanish was actually my first language, believe it or not. Oh, okay. Um, I spoke only Spanish pretty much until the time I was four, uh, which was the first time we came to the States on furlough, um, which is basically a vacation to the States instead of, you know, somewhere else. Um, my parents taught me how to speak English out of coloring books so I could communicate with my grandparents and relatives. Oh, cool. But because my parents are American and we spoke mostly English in the house. And when I came to the States at nine, um, I have lost most of my Spanish ability. Um, the downside to that is I still speak Spanish with an absolutely perfect, uh, Colombian accent. So if I do pull out some of my Spanish in front of a native Spanish speaker, they automatically think I'm fluent. And mm -hmm. so they'll start firing off in Spanish and I have to tell him, no, I'm just actually a stupid American. That sounds like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and usually that, that stops him pretty fast. <laughs> well, well, that's cool. Um, I know conversational Spanish, um, street Spanish type thing from Colombia. Uh, when I took Spanish in American high school, I got like D's in it most of the time, which people couldn't comprehend. But, you know, I, I didn't learn educated Spanish. You know, I learned Spanish off the streets. Hmm. So, uh, the, um, the I different... also know. Uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was the different tribes. They spoke Spanish too, or no? And that's just what I was going to get into. A lot of the tribes down there, um, some of them are related, and so they have very similar uh, languages. Um, the tribe that we worked with had a completely unrelated language. In fact, the closest thing that they could come to was actually an Asiatic language, something off the Asian continent. Mm. Um, but even then, it was still completely unique. Um, the Indians we worked with, and I use the term Indian, I know that's not necessarily politically correct, but that's how I was raised calling them. To me, they will always be the Indians. So, blast me if you will, it's okay. <laughs> um, they even look very Asian. So they're completely uh, landlocked, isolated. They don't speak Spanish. They, they have nothing in common with Spanish or any of the other languages down there. Um, their tribal language was completely different from any other tribal language down there either. Um, so it was a complete unique experience. Yeah. But yeah. Right. You want to talk about some crazy, some real crazy stuff. And you start talking about world population and language dispersion, uh, try finding an Asiatic, uh, sounding base language in the middle of the Amazon jungle. <laughs> that, that would make sense though, because <laughs> most of those tribes came from the Bering land bridge. Uh huh. Yeah. From the Bering. And yet they were unique enough where they didn't even speak similar to the other native tribes around them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and, and they all came over, uh, and they were all natives, and they eventually spread out throughout North and South America, and each one just found its own niche and kind of stayed to themselves. 
We, you know, to this day, we don't really know how many tribes were also just annihilated. We ne- we don't have any trace of them. No. Because the Mayans. We have no idea how many are still there or how many have been there or right. how many. Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. We, we know that the Mayans and Aztecs literally, I mean, they take credit for wiping out, you know, like dozens of tribes. Yeah. I mean, like they either yeah. absorbed them and forced them and they subjugated them into their culture or they completely yep. annihilated them. One of the things I always find funny and to me is people, and, and it really what it is to me is uneducated people, okay, or overly right. educated if you want to put it that way. They believe in this romanticized version of the Mayan civilizations and the Aztec civilizations, but what they don't get is that those civilizations were built on broken bodies. They literally oh, subjugated and enslaved all of their their surrounding neighbors they 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 killed them i mean they used them in ritual sacrifice Absolutely. their temples were built by slave labor everything that they had was taken and 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 forcefully from their neighbors yep. uh, the aztecs um you know when they arrived at tenochtitlan they didn't build tenochtitlan they didn't build that city and they no. actually uh you know, destroyed all of their neighboring tribes' cultures that were just wiped out and lost, or they incorporated bits and pieces of them into their own culture. And they, you know, the Zapotecs, the mixed mixed text, the Toltecs, they were all pretty much absorbed into the Aztec Empire, and the Aztecs themselves yep. kind of had control over those people. And but the Mayans did the same thing, and the Mayans, of course, eventually. Um, started to be uh, just you know chipped away by the what was left of them was chipped away by the rise of the Aztecs. They pretty much were the death knell for the Mayans. Uh, the Spaniards get the bad rap and get the get credit for destroying the Mayans, but they were already on their uh, last that's leg. Written history, yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, they were on their last leg when the Spaniards arrived, and they just gave them a push over the edge, and then 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 finished them off, and then went up and destroyed the Aztecs. But they had a lot of help. They did it with a lot of the neighboring Indians that were against the Aztecs. Yeah, you know what kills me is people don't think logically about this kind of stuff, right? So if we think logically, how many boats of of conquistadors and Spaniards actually came over? Well, there were 650 that actually defeated the Aztecs. (laughs) I mean, right. Well, but think about that for a second. Did is that really how it happened? No, no. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What really happened? They had to get all these other tribes. If that empire was so huge and so awesome and so great, and they were masters at murder and torture. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Masters at, at, at taking all these other tribes and just annihilating them. You're telling me 650 people because they have horses and a, maybe a little bit of so-called superior firepower could totally wipe out a whole nation like that. That's what people think. Yeah. And, and to me, that's insane. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, be, being Latino myself uh, um, of Latin descent, I guess my my, uh, my Hispanic name is Josue Pablo Turner. <laughs> and so, <laughs> no, my dad is Caucasian, although my dad growing up, he spoke better Spanish than I I ever did. But my dad was, was very, uh, like, uh, Latinized, I guess you could say. My mom being Mexican, I, I learned a lot about my culture, where it came from and this and that. One of the things I learned was that, that the Aztecs were very, um, they're very celebrated uh, in, in, in the, the Mexican culture. And it's always lamented, uh, what happened to them, but it's, <laughs> they would have eventually uh, at the pace that they were going. And it started, I guess the, the, the human sacrifice on the, the, the grand level started under the emperor of Guatemoc because of one of his ministers that said, Hey, this is what we should be doing. And so they, they began to commit human sacrifice on a level that has never been seen before or since in the world that we know. And I know that they were uh, a very superstitious people with a lot of crazy ideas and beliefs, you know, that, that the sun needed blood. Uh, they were afraid of Teotihuacan, which was a city that was a neighboring city of, 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 uh, of their, their capital, of Tenochtitlan, and which is very odd that they actually would not inhabit that city because they believed that it was a city of the gods and the gods ruled that city and they were not supposed to go there. They were very superstitious for in, in such an advanced culture. They had a lot of, of, of like just hamstringing themselves by their, their beliefs and their false gods and their, their, their need for human sacrifice was so great 
they wiped out all these different tribes that, that were just completely lost to history and it, and they will never be known and we will never really know the full you know of what they did and we also know that if they would have kept going at the pace that they were going they would have actually uh, ended themselves right um, they would have had to keep on blood sacrificing even once there was nobody else to do. They would have had to turn on their lower caste and their systems. Yes. Yeah. They actually were on pace to destroy themselves. So, yep. you know, when people, uh, you know, lament the, that, you know, the, their downfall, I'm thinking really the Spaniards saved that culture because if they wouldn't have, there wouldn't be a Mexican people or Mexican culture. Um, they were on right. pace to have been obliterated by their own hand. The Mayans pretty much had done that to themselves too. Once they were, like you said, the Mayans were a case in point. They had already uh, annihilated so many uh, of the neighboring tribes. They, they were they were starting to do it to themselves, and so yeah. And then when the Aztecs rose up, the the the, the furthest northern Mayan cities, we know that where they were wiped out and destroyed by the Aztecs. Now there's this big push to rewrite history and and change things as fast as they can to try to make everything seem different, but that's not the case. I mean, right. no, archaeologically, there's a, there's evidence of pretty much everything that's gone on. I actually argued with this idiot on on Facebook one day, and she was like, "the the Spaniards came and killed everybody and broke and destroyed and the poor this and that." I was like, "The Mayans, the the Aztecs, pretty much defeated <laughs> them. The, the, what was left of them, you know." And then by yeah. the time they came, the 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 Spaniards didn't really see them as a feasible ally because of their human sacrificing and all that, and so they. We're like these people are worthless, you know. So they and they got rid of them. What was left of them, anyway? And the Mayans were scattered throughout the jungle, and they weren't concentrated in one or two, three cities like the Aztecs were. So they they were they were able to survive and still be a people and be a people apart from um, the you know. So they're able to still they're they're still there. They still exist. Whereas the Aztecs don't really exist anymore in in the way that that you know. Their their blood runs through the Mexican people, but it, it, if you if you look at the truth, I mean, like what really happened, like the the, the Spaniards kind of saved the the Mexicans from themselves as far as like them being the natives. Yeah, yeah, and, absolutely. And, yeah, and that's so we kind of got off on a tangent there, but that's something that I've studied. <laughs> I've studied extensively on that subject, and I've always well, been fascinated what, by it. It's actually a pretty good segue because what's happened with this tribe is really sad. Um, so I, I lived with them for a long time. Um, and then we had to leave because of, like you talked about, the FARC group was putting pressure on the government. Um, anthropologists were putting pressure on the government because they felt the, the missionarios, the missionaries, were out there trying to change the culture of, of this tribe. And the reality is nothing really was further from the truth from what we were doing. We were trying to learn their language. We assimilated into their culture. We learned their culture. We weren't pushing our culture on them. The house we lived in, we got permission from the tribal elders to put the house there. We asked them, hey, where would you like us to be? They're the ones that told us where to go. We built our house so we could be safe, but we did not push anything on them. We were there to learn from them. Yes, the ultimate goal was to uh, bring the gospel to them and, and to get a Bible translated into their language. That is always the ultimate goal of missionaries, true, but not in the way of disrupting their culture. Um, if, if that makes any sense. I know there's a lot of people that disagree with that, and that's perfectly fine. They're allowed to. Um, but that's what we did. Um, but eventually, we were told we had to leave. Yeah. And, well, and so we did. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, groups like FARC tend to be made up of, especially in the lower ranks, of people who are uneducated, who don't, they, they're just yeah. told, this is what they're doing, and they're bad. And the upper echelons are are just educated enough to be dangerous, and typically, they they read a a washed history, uh, you know, of of an idealized history that they want to believe, and they go they go half cocked based on that and think that the, the, oh this is a, this is what we need to do be a revolution. Yeah, and absolutely, communism is basically that in a nutshell. I mean, I, I, yeah, I just, and, and you know, obviously they're they're against Christianity and everything it stands for, so of course they're gonna have opposition as being out there. Now, the other threat we had to face that a lot of people don't realize is the coqueros, the, the, the cocaine farmers, the drug runners, right? Yes, it's Colombia, and I, I can't tell you how many jokes I've heard about that. <laughs> um, but that was a real and constant threat for us. Um, in fact, I remember recently talking with my oldest brother about this. He was in his late teens, early and late teens when we were out in the jungle. 
And he remembers that first house I lived in, uh, the, the, the lake house, we called it. As they were leaving, the final uh, helicopter and airplane leaving with our supplies getting away from there, they could hear the Coqueto's boats coming up the lake to come over and, and take over everything um, because they wanted our supplies. They wanted the, the wood from the houses. They, anything that they could scavenge, they would scavenge. And if they had found anybody there, they would have killed them. You guys um, barely so that was made it out? constant threat. They, they literally barely made it out, yes. Um, which is, which is, was our life down there. The, the other house we moved into, uh, we had a tin roof on it and we had it tucked back up under the trees and the tin roof was painted green to match the foliage of the jungle, um, to help kind of hide the house a little bit. Um, the airstrip they built out there was built in such a way it looked more like a jungle garden or a bear patch than an actual airstrip. Um, so that was all part of camouflage and disguise just to keep us safe from the Coquettos and from FARC. <clears throat> but what's happened with this tribe, um, they've been pushed out of the jungle, and you can actually find documentaries on them now. Um, the Last Forest Nomads, uh, the Nakuk Maku, they call them. If you pull it up, you'll find all kinds of stuff on this tribe now that I used to live with. And they've been pushed out of the jungle basically into uh, what we would call in the States like a reservation. And their numbers are dwindling and their culture is dying off. So it, it's highly ironic that they were accusing my parents and the people like us of being out there to destroy their culture. When in reality, their own society pushed them out and destroyed their culture. Well, that's what always happens too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's pretty much what happens. It's always that. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah, we could get into that. I mean, it's a whole nother show, <laughs> but here, here we have a, uh, a situation, um, where your parents and you had to leave and then the fart came and they were the, after you guys had left and they, you guys had escaped and they were looking to kill you guys. Yes. So what ended up happening was we were out at the school base. Um, now our school base out in the, in the Andes, it was completely self uh, contained. We had our own airstrip, our own airplanes, our own pilots, um, we had our own buildings. We had our own water supply. We had our own electrical supply. We had our own radio towers. So we were basically a self contained community. Um, which is obviously for a group like FARC is a very attractive uh, target. So that way they can just move in and boom, they already have a base with everything they need, including pilots and airplanes, right? Um, so at one point, um, a stranger had appeared at a school base um, and he was a local, a uh, homeless crazy guy. And he was going around and he was harassing uh, different teachers, some of the single teachers and stuff like that. Now, what was really... Um, Unusual about this is we were several miles outside of town, not a place a, a homeless person is generally going to go. It was a mountain road. It wasn't a very long mountain road, but if you had a car, it would take several hours to drive it because the conditions were so bad, even in a Jeep, right? So it's one of those places where you had to want to get there and know how to get there before you could actually get there. Um, so my dad being who he is, um, he, he's like me. We're very, we're very much like Josh. Right. We're the defenders, we're the protectors, we're the warriors. Um, that's just who we are. I mean, that, that's ingrained in, in us from the beginning. And that was my dad. And so what he did is he went and got this local and drove him into town to the local police station and said, hey, this guy was out here harassing our people. Come to find out, the guy was actually a spy for FARC. And he had been out there casing the place out. So my dad ended up on their, their hit list. Um, and so that caused a bunch of interesting things for the next probably year or two. <laughs> um, and eventually it was decided that it'd be best if we just, just left the country altogether. Um, and so we did. That was when I was nine. Uh, it would have been June of 91. Uh, we left. And then it wasn't too long after that where they actually did come in and raid the school base. Um, ended up kidnapping uh, three of the men that were there. Uh, they had been asking for my dad. Uh, but he wasn't there. They were asking for him by name. Um, kidnapped three of the men, held them for ransom. Um, and then eventually, after a military conflict outside of Bogota, the capital, they were found executed, um, which is horrible. Uh, I knew these men well. Um, one of my best friends from down there was, it was one of their dads. Um, and that was just part of part of the dangers that we faced down there. And unfortunately it came to realization for some of my friends. 
That's horrible. No, but that's what ended up causing us to ultimately leave leave the, the mission field and leave Columbia. And I haven't been back since. Well, one of one of the things you'll be glad to know is that FARC is now. Um, yes. Yeah, they're disbanded supposedly. <laughs> so <clears throat> um, when I found out about that, I called my mom and I was literally in tears. Uh, just saying, did, did you hear this? Did you hear this? Did you hear this? And she said, no. And they pulled it up and, uh, it was, it was an emotional moment for my family for sure. <clears throat> so that was a good Sorry, thing. That's sad. <laughs> one, one of the things I was going to talk to you about is some of the local legends down there too. Um, you guys, Absolutely. You, you, you had mentioned something about a creature, um, mm-hmm. that, that would come out of the darkness and drink blood. Yep. Yep, absolutely. So uh, this is a really interesting story. Um, the Indians we worked with didn't have any positive part of a religion so that there was no good deities or anything, but it was always based on fear and, and danger, right? Because living in the jungle is basically based on fear and danger. Uh, and there's one specific creature they called Nimit. And uh, during the day, it would sleep in hollow trees. And at night, it would come out and hunt. And if it found somebody away from the safety of the, the campfire from the family, uh, it would capture them and kill them and drain their blood. Now, the description of it is what always got me. Um, it is a classic hominid Bigfoot description. Um, a little bit on the shorter side, uh, four to five feet tall, hairy, long arms, walked upright, uh, looked like an ape. Um, and that was one of the, their main fears other than the jaguar at night. Was, was this creature that would come out and, and take you and, and drink your blood. That's interesting because you, you, you think your dad may have encountered something similar to that. Like they saw these, Absolutely. Th- there were three of them, right? Yep. There was three of them. Um, so this was a time when my dad was doing the jungle exploring. Now this was before we worked with this other tribe before he had ever heard of these legends. Um, <clears throat> they had been exploring down. I believe he said it was a sun burner to the river. Uh, one of the tributaries down there. Um, and we were mostly based off the Orinoco River Basin area. Um, they have been traveling. Now, people think traveling through the jungle is glamorous on the river. You know, we see the the movies where it's like, oh, look, there's the parrots and there's the monkeys and there's the taper in the water. And it's not like that. The sound of the motor scares all the animals away. So you have hours and hours of nothing but trees and river. Okay. So when you see an animal, it's actually kind of a bigger event. And a lot of times you're going to see if you can hunt it for food for that night's meal. Um, but they had to come around a river, a river bend. And way off in the distance, up in the canopy, my dad saw three large uh, black monkeys, is how he described them, because there's no New, new World Apes down there. Uh, but he said they were very large. They were at least the size of chimpanzees. So we're talking, you know, in the three-foot range. They were very black. Um, he could not tell if they had any tails or not. Um, but he said, just after they saw them, after a couple of seconds of seeing them, they must have caught the sound of the boat motor and they took off through the canopy uh, at an amazing rate of speed, just so fast that they couldn't even, they were just gone. On two legs um, or four? Now, they, they were up in the canopy, so they couldn't tell. Mm. Now, my, my dad likened their movement to um, like spider monkeys, mm. just how exceptionally fast they can move through the trees. So obviously these creatures were definitely arboreal. Um, but like I said, he couldn't tell if they had any tails or not. Uh, but they were definitely bigger, larger, and faster than any of the local animals that they were familiar with. And mind you, these guys would live in the jungle for months at a time. They were quite familiar with all the local animals as far as what kind of monkeys were in the area, uh, birds, you know, things like that. They hunted them for food. Uh, so they were very familiar with with how they moved and the sounds that they would make and, and their size and their shapes and different things like that. And these were completely unfamiliar to them at all, but they fit the size and description of what we later heard in that legend uh, from the native tribes, other than the fact that they were seen during the day. Now. Yeah. And that makes sense. Like they, they could have been literally like these, these monkeys, they, they could have act- because and, and I, I don't want to say they're monkeys because they were the size of apes and like you said there's no apes down there there's monkeys spider monkeys and, and right. tree you know howler monkeys but not there's no apes you know so 
I mean, if it was Africa, you'd say, okay, they're a type of chimp, bonobo, whatever, but they're not. This right. was in, this was in right. Central America, South America, whatever. Um, they're not, uh, there's no apes there. So what were they? And, and it, and it fits the description of the creature that comes down and drinks the blood. I mean, that is a very weird story. Um, and, Which and, if we were looking at it from the, the cryptozoology point of view, um, it would be likened to what we would call the Deloitte ape, which has long been thought to be a hoax or a fabricated. Yeah. Yeah. And that's and, what I always liken it to is Deloitte ape. It makes you wonder, like, I mean, I don't know, dude. It's it's crazy. I mean, so yeah, what, you, what, you just don't know what <laughs> it, the villagers and the people that you were around, the people that you were with. Mm -hmm. Did any of them ever talk about this ape? Like, did they tell you they had seen it like themselves? Not that I know of. Um, I, I only know of it as a, a campfire story. Um, now, now, mind you, I was really young when I was down there. Um, I did have two uh, native friends and I, I didn't speak the language well enough so I could communicate that type of thing with them. Um, so I didn't get a lot of that stuff. This is the things that I have heard um, from my dad as he was studying the language and, and as he learned more about the culture and how he would explain things to me from what he was learning. Man, that would have been amazing to get footage of that. <laughs> oh, it would have been. <laughs> yeah. Another yeah, thing, my, you my dad even tells a story of one time they were going down and they had the Amazonian giant river otters follow them for three days just as they were doing some of their exploration. So the things that my dad has seen and experienced in the jungle, just, I mean, absolutely amazing. That is crazy. Yep. The otter is another creature that's, gets very, uh, <laughs> has a lot of legends oh, yeah. around it mystical because they have very human like traits. And, um, especially I, the giant ones down there, absolutely, they're as big yeah. as a human as well. Well, there's yeah. a lot of folklore of them being shapeshifters, shapeshifters. And, and, and just all kinds of stuff down there. Yeah, just read about that. Yeah, we 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 did a show with David Weatherly about that, and and we talked about the yep. the, the, the the giant otters, the uh, the Kushtika. You know, what's what's really weird though is I had a friend years ago who who he claimed that he had an otter as a pet. And, um, he did have several different types of animals and he had this weird, like little enclosure that he had built. Um, he was a person who got his money through not so legal <laughs> means. And I don't really, uh, don't, 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 he's not even around anymore. He's gone, but, um, he did have one and he said it was, it, it, it grew almost to the size of a, of a large dog. That's what he claimed. Oh, yeah. And he was like, yeah. he, he didn't know. He thought it was like this little baby and he raised it. But he said that it had a very close <laughs> relationship with his daughter and his son. And his name was Buddy. And they mm -hmm. had a female named Biscuit, from what I remember. And she died when they were little, when they was young. She got real sick. But the male lived. But he could be very aggressive and violent at times uh, uh, towards people that he didn't like. And he was mischievous. And he had very human-like qualities. And he said that there was almost a mystical quality about this animal. Like, like they had a camera and they, he figured out how to get out of his enclosure. And for some reason, when they would come, when they were coming home, they lived down this long driveway. So maybe he heard it or something. I don't know. But he said that like shortly before they would be getting onto the driveway, he would run and get back in his enclosure and act like everything was cool. But he would get out That's and he awesome. would let the other animals out and play with them. And then he would round the other animals up and put them back in their cage. It's crazy. Like the things that he did. That's and, insane. And, yeah. That he attributed to this thing. So, I, I mean, me and, and several of my brothers from back in the day, we can all attest that this guy's telling us this. And now this guy did have uh, two coyotes. He had a, a wolf. Um, he had a cougar. He had like a, a falcon or maybe two. He had two falcons, like three or four hawks and an eagle. This guy had all kinds of stuff. And uh, it was up here in the hill country and, um, had like, I can't even tell you how many different types of birds and, and like, like an aviary basically. And it was like this otter that he had, we, all we ever saw of it was the enclosure cause the animal had disappeared and he never knew what became of it, but we did see pictures of it and, and it, they were, it was as big as his kids. And I was going like, what, how did they get that big? You know, and back then in my twenties, I had no, I, I, I spent time, you know, uh, overseas and then down, you know, not where you were at, but in a different country. And I never, I heard stories of these giant otters, but I never saw them. Yeah. 
very rare, rare. Exactly. very rare. Really rare. Yeah, yep. you, you, I would yep. hear stories of that, and I heard uh, stories of the corta cabeza. Um, and the corta cabeza was known as as a giant bird. Now I don't know if you've ever heard of these stories, um, but they were known as the head cutters, and that they would swoop down and they were as big as people, and that they would bite man's heads off. And oh wow! The, yeah, they they would either bite them or they would they would use their talons and 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 tear the head off of a man. And then they would swoop back down and grab the body. And the closest I came was a clump of trees. Like I, I told this story back when Sal was my co-host. And there was a clump of trees where if you want to go back in the archives, folks, and maybe find it, um, I did see silhouette that could have been that. <laughs> and so we went about 10 kilometers around that spot because we were told by the porters that they were like, no, 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 no go, no go, no go, you know to stay outside of that, you know, outside of that area, you know, fuera, you know, and I told him, all right, so fine. So we went around and we had this one guy who was a hardhead and he was like, I'm not doing that. I'm walking right through that. I don't care. I don't give a dang. You know, he was an Aussie and there was another guy that was with him that was, you know, was, was from Estonia, I believe. And he was, they were like, yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to go this. We're going to go that. So they, three of them walked through there. And when they got the other side of the pass, they were fine, but they swore up and down that they saw, um, we had these big cargo boxes and they were showing us and now they're about six foot tall and we were back at the HQ and they were saying, this is how big they were. And he said, I saw one, I saw one. Oh my gosh. And they, that it was eating like there were animal carcasses and bones around that, that clump of trees and that they were eating what looked like yeah. a person. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so the closest thing I can think of that would be like a harpy eagle, um, you know, because they eat monkeys and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But that, that's still massive. <laughs> yeah. And that's what it, that's the description of it was like something prehistoric. Um, like yeah. think of like a, a pterosaur with some sort of feathers on it. That's the only thing I could describe the way that they described it and that it had these teeth and they could hear it crunching. And because it was, they were eating something, they believe that's why it didn't come after them. Now, these guys were heavily armed, so they probably would have gave it a run for its money. If it would have tried something, they probably would have smoked it. But um, they said they only saw one, and, and but the tree was moving like there was something above it. Like maybe, they don't know for sure, but it might have been maybe a monkey up, up there that was hiding from it or uh, another one of these birds. But they saw something moving in the tree, and whatever this one was, it was devouring whatever. And they saw that one. And, uh, yeah, and they described it as big as a, as a cargo box. And I was like, that, that sounded weird to me, wow. but the porters seemed to be really afraid and they weren't going to move. They weren't going to go through that area. Right. So we had to go all the way around well, and it took us half the day to get through that other side. But it's worth another one of our rules was if a native tells you, you listen to them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's that simple. Like I remember one time I was out with my dad and, uh, we had come across this fruit. My dad was not familiar with it. It was probably about the size of a baseball. Um, very, very spiky, like just spines all over it. Um, big, thick, heavy spines. Um, the ones still on the bush were yellow. The ones that had dropped were, were brown and kind of dried out. I remember my dad wrapping some up in some leaves and carrying it back. Um, two of them. Um, he had me carry one and he carried one. And we showed one of the Indian boys, uh, one of the guys that was kind of adopted to our family. And he immediately knocked it out of my dad's hand and started yelling at him. So apparently we knew that was a bad thing. You don't mess with that fruit. And so my dad being my dad took the one that I had. And of course he cut it open and, and kind of examined it a little bit. I remember the inside looking very similar to watermelon, uh, the red flesh and black seeds. Um, but it was yellow and spiky. And I have never heard or come across any description of that fruit ever before. Um, but it was this Indian knew it was bad. And so we listened to him. We didn't try and eat it or we were very careful with it. Um, or, yeah, there's a local and he's telling you to do something. You listen to him. That's Just right. Suck it up and do it. <laughs> now, see, I, I, what, what I would have suspected with my suspicious nature was that he knocked the fruit out of your dad's hand and said, no, 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 no good. And then when your dad went into the, to the, to the hut, he went out there and grabbed it and took it out to the woods and ate it himself. You know, I wouldn't surprise me either. <laughs> 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 oh, I was just kidding. I, don't know. I know they were they were a very generous people. And yeah. So if they had something, they would share it. I yeah, mean, that's I mean, how they were. were. They were communal in nature. Um, but you know, they're still individual personalities, so I wouldn't I wouldn't put it past one of them either. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true because like I was told some some stories that I don't even get into on the show because 
uh, me and my wife actually talked about them, and she was like, you should talk about those on the show. I was like, no, nah, I was later told that they were bullcrap. So, mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. so they'll tell you things, and if you believe it, you know what I mean? Like, you know, but yeah. with the, the Corta Cabeza, I could I can attest to that because this, this these guys were like, they, they claimed to have seen it, and I was They born. were genuinely afraid. Mm-hmm. So I was like, yeah, that, that's as close as I came. I didn't see it myself. And if I don't see it myself with my own eyes, I don't count it as an encounter. But speaking of encounters, now you you had an encounter. Now, this is a crazy story I wanted to get into. <laughs> you well, you know what? Let's back up. What, what about the the when you, the the stories you got from the missionaries uh, that you guys had met when you came back? Now, explain what your dad did. You came back, and you, they went to the churches to gather donations. Now, go ahead and start with that one, and then you can talk about what happened in Africa. Okay. Um, and so uh, part of being a missionary and how you get paid is you get paid by donations from churches and different individuals, Okay. Um, and so before you go out into the field, you do what's called deputization, which is where you travel around and you speak at different churches and you try and raise funds to support you while you're down there. Um, and that is, at least with the several different missionary groups I've worked at, is how a missionary makes their money. So you have missionaries that make a lot of money and some that don't, you know, just to support themselves. Um, and so what would happen, and that is why my dad took the pictures that we had talked about earlier, Nelly, um, was so he would put together a presentation. So he could show the churches, this is what we're doing. You're sending us money. We're grateful for this is uh, the fruits of your labor, the fruits of your donations. Okay. And, and, and we would do that. And so we became, uh, we had our home church, which is the church that sends you out. And then you have all these other churches that over the years you become very friendly with. Um, whenever we came to the States, we spent our time traveling um, just from state to state to state, from church to church to church, staying in people's houses. Um, and that just was part of, you know, the lifestyle of, of being a missionary. And in doing so, you, you get to hear a lot of amazing stories and a lot of fellowship and um, a lot of interesting things. And so what, what Josh is talking about was a story we had heard um, from missionaries in Africa. Um, and basically how it went down was there was a prayer meeting one night and normally it was a set amount of people, let's just say 20. I don't know the number, but we're going to call it 20 just for the story. Um, and it, it stuck in these people's minds because that night, uh, some of them weren't there. So let's just say there were 17 in that group that particular night. And during this prayer meeting, they had this overwhelming urge to pray for a very specific missionary in Africa. Um, and just to, to pray protection over him um, and, and his group of people that they were with. Um, they didn't know why, but when you're a believer in the faith and you believe in the power of prayer, and that feeling comes upon you, you just kind of go with it. This is kind of what we do. Um, so later on, several months later, those missionaries were back in the States. And they were doing the, this traveling around and talking to the different groups. And they were talking to this, this church group. And then this amazing story came out. Um, that very night, those missionaries were in a hut. Everything seemed normal to them. Uh, but this, this urge to pray for this prayer group came over them. Um, further on down, uh, during the missionaries work, they befriended these certain natives in the area. Uh, they talked to them and come to find out on that very night, those particular tribesmen were actually on their way to kill the missionaries and everybody in this hut. Well, once they got to the hut to kill them, um, they couldn't because this hut was surrounded by warriors that were, were just luminescent and then glowing and they were armed and big and, and they were afraid of them. So they left. Um, and there were 17 of them, 17 of these warriors. And so the story, once you get all pieces together, you find out there was 17 people at this prayer meeting, praying protection over these missionaries on the same night where these natives were coming to kill them. And the idea is there was an angel for every one of the people that were praying uh, protection over these missionaries. Oh, that's so, incredible. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. And, and you think about it, like when you hear the story from the tribesmen, they don't really have a concept of angels, mm-hmm. right? They don't, they don't have the same religious constructs, but they're still describing it to you exactly what you know what it is. And that, that's just mind blowing to me anyway, for sure. That's it. Those are good, good goosebumps. <laughs> they saved them. <laughs> yeah. So gr- growing up with us, and especially the way my dad taught us with the Bible, 
um, the spiritual world is very real. Um, it's not just feel good feelings. It's not just positive energy. It's real. It's visceral. There's good entities. There's bad entities. And it's all just part of the reality that we live in. Definitely. I believe so that those were, well. and that, yeah, absolutely. And that was a prime example of, of that, you know, mm-hmm. you hear about that kind of stuff, like, um, people running, like seeing angels, angelic beings, um, quite uh-huh. often, more often than you would think. And, uh, absolutely. which reminds me of, have you ever heard of the butterfly people? Not on those terms. No, I can't say I have. Well, it wouldn't be very much to talk about about it, but um, it was just there was a, f- a few stories that I've heard about them. But they they say that they're 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 angelic beings with uh, butterfly wings, and they what when you see them, they're there to save your life. I I believe. Okay. So, but the Which, sudden, and that makes perfect sense to me because even the bible it describes different angelic beings as, as being different different numbers of wings different types of wings you know so why not why not butterfly wings to throw in there as well right different stations absolutely so um what happened after th- they just they just left and they didn't uh, try to attack the um the people because they were yep, afraid they were, they were too afraid yep they were too afraid to attack them um they were too well protected and so they left and they didn't attack him. That's amazing. And we, we had different similar stories like that growing up. We we would hear. Um, because the mission tribe, the mission group that we worked with, they're they're um international, they're in Africa, they're in Asia, they're in South America. So you would hear different stories from different regions of, of similar things of, of angelic protection. For sure. When you were out there, did you ever witness any angelic uh sightings? Um, no, uh, me personally, no, uh, nothing that came through my family or anybody that I knew directly as far as what happened to us. Um, we had other miracles definitely happen in our family, but nothing, uh, nothing like seeing, you know, an angelic warrior or anything like that. So, cause you grew up and you were, you were born and raised there. Did, um, did uh, you ever like experience that intuition to pray for somebody? Yes, I still do. You do? Absolutely. I do. Yeah, it's it's just a pull and it's, hey, you know what? And I got to admit, sometimes I don't always listen to it. Um, and that's my own shame and my own things I'm going to have to, uh, you know, account for when the time comes. Uh, but I really do try to because I believe in the power of prayer and I believe um, it, it's an active thing. You know, it's not just uh, thank you, God, for my food. You know, it, it's, hey, there's a spiritual battle going on right now. And our, our prayers help fuel that and provide the energy for it and different things like that. Um, so yeah, if I, if I get that urge, I'd definitely try to, to obey it and follow it. Do you ever get like, um, warning signals as well? Like you need to get out of a situation because there, there is something supernaturally around that is, uh, I have, uh, you know, uh, a feeling of a bad energy or this is a bad place or, Hey, something, something just isn't right. Um, so it'd be best to either leave or, you know, pray, a hedge of protection around yourself or, or kind of whatever the leading is to do in that situation. For sure. Have you ever like not listened to the voice and ended up seeing something or? Well, there, there was a time in my life where I, I went rogue. You could say I was the prodigal son for sure. Um, and I definitely wasn't praying or listening to the voices, but I know other people were. And, and there was definitely protection coming from other people at that point, even when I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing. I can definitely attest to that. Do you think that um, some people out there that even if they don't have somebody praying for them that and they're not right, you know, walking the right line, that uh, God still looks out for them because they, you know, there's something he's using them? I think so, too. Absolutely. Uh, uh, why not? I mean, we're all his children, whether we accept him or not, we're still his children. Um, it, it, it's, it's up to us to accept him. He already accepts us. You know, I mean, yeah, he lets us follow on our own paths and, and we still have to suffer the consequences of our, our choices and actions. Um, but but I, I firmly believe that he, he will protect and hedge you from the things he needs to protect and hedge you from, uh, for sure. Um, but the, the whys and hows and, and the understanding of what he does, I mean, obviously that's beyond me. That's beyond the kind of men for sure. Uh, but I definitely believe it. Absolutely. 
So with um, your family, did they, did your siblings ever say that they seen anything out there or had any supernatural paranormal experiences um, while they were out there in the jungle? No, um, we don't really talk a whole lot about specifics. I'm, I'm pretty much the only one. Um, because of a lot of the different things we had to deal with and, and stuff I hadn't gotten into on here, most of my older siblings came away with, with some, uh, I guess, PTSD, for the lack of a better terms for it. Um, From the so supernatural? we don't discuss a lot of it. Um, well, I mean, some of it would be considered supernatural, but other of it was just the, the trauma of living the life that we live. Mm. Um, the constant fear, the constant danger. Um, so if they did experience things that, you know, it would be all put together and then we just don't generally talk about it. I talk about it freely, uh, with my parents, but my other siblings don't generally talk about it a whole lot. What, what did you experience? If you don't mind me asking. No, not at all. I don't mind. Um, so as we talked a little bit, a little bit, we were living with constant fear of the gorillas, uh, the fart group, um, the coquettos, um, so basically, we were raised in a culture of having to always look out and always have to be afraid and always have to be aware of of everybody around us is basically what it boiled down to. Um, by the time I was in kindergarten, uh, I had to have my own machete, know how to use it. I had my own gun already, knew how to use it. We were taught basic survival skills. Um, by the time we hit first or second grade, we were able to survive by ourselves in the jungle uh, for about two weeks was what our training was based on enough time to get back into the major cities if we needed to. Um, and all this was because of the idea of if we ever got attacked, we could disperse. Um, we had evacuation routes. We had our, I guess what now is termed bug out bags. We call them go packs. Um, but that was how we lived, but it was that constant hyper vigilance almost of at any moment in time we had to evacuate. And we did have to a few times. And Run sometimes that would show up, basically. <laughs> yep. Um, there was times where uh, after my dad had put the spy in jail, we had a, a big tractor, basically, parked outside of our house because a tractor could get down the mountain road faster than a normal vehicle or a Jeep. And we had our go packs and our weapon. We already packed at any moment. So we had our drill. If we were told, we just we just left. Um, there were times where the threat of attack was so severe, they evacuated the school base and we'd have to go into town. Um, we all had townhouses, but we would be under complete blackout lockdown where no lights were allowed. You were not allowed to go by the windows. You were not allowed to go outside. Uh, my dad, the older brothers would stay up at night guarding the house with, with guns. Um, while the war was going on blocks away from our house, you could hear the gunfire, you could hear the helicopters, you could see them flying over with dead bodies underneath them. Um, things like that. Uh, and it you, was definitely you witnessed a, this? basically a civil war. Yeah. Yeah. I witnessed that. At such a young age? Um, yes. Oh my gosh. Yep. Uh, my dad, uh, while we were down there, we're, we're darker people, um, olive skinned, I guess you would say. So, in the tropical sun, uh, he definitely looked like he was Colombian. He was very fluent in Spanish. Um, so he ended up being like the liaison for the Americans and the Colombians. So even under lockdown, he would go out and meet with his contacts to find out what was going on uh, with, with, you know, the situation we were in. Um, so we were always under that constant fear that he, he could be taken away at any time. He could be killed at any time. Um, that was just how we were raised and me being so young, it didn't impact me as much until later on, once I came to the full realization of what was going on, uh, but my siblings being my, my sister is like three or four years older than me. Um, so she was already old enough to be kind of aware. And then my two older brothers were older than her. So they were kind of right in the thick of things. Um, and, and that definitely caused, you know, some issues that had to be worked out. <laughs> yeah. This is a nice way to put it. Yeah, very nice um, way of putting it. So, um, the, like I said, a lot of that stuff we, we don't discuss. We have our high points, and we always talk about the same things whenever we talk about stuff because those are the easy things to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of the stuff they won't they won't go over at all. Okay, folks, that's all the time we have for today with Justin Decker. We'll be back next week with part two in another episode of PRT.